Howdy everyone and welcome to the Serial Geek TV YouTube channel. My name is James Etock and today we're going to take a look at some Transformers episodes that featured quintessential examples of the horror genre with an overview of the episodes involved. Frankenstein's Monster Frankenstein, a classic of the horror genre, is fairly easy to adapt into the Transformers universe. Taken at its simplest, man creates monstrosity, and that's exactly what we see in the second season episode, Autobot Spike. It was even called Frankenstein Spike in Japan. How cool is that? In the episode, Sparkplug cobbles together a robot from various spare Autobot parts. He names it Autobot X and gives it a test run during which it goes on a rampage and is quickly deactivated. Meanwhile, the Decepticons attack a rocket base and the Autobots rush off to stop them, because that's what they do. And Spike accompanies the Autobots into a war zone, because that's what he does. During the fight, Spike is badly injured and the only way the Doctor can operate on his fragile body is by moving his mind elsewhere during the procedure. Instead of consulting a better Doctor, the Autobots and Sparkplug transfer Spike's mind into the body of Autobot X. What could possibly go wrong? The trauma leaves Spike unstable, and he is tricked by Megatron into fighting against the Autobots. It's only when he nearly kills his father that he regains his senses, and the Autobots can transfer his mind back into his healed body. We see some very clear Frankenstein references throughout the episode. Visually, Autobot X is a patchwork of Autobot parts, much like Frankenstein's monster was made up of various bits of corpses. A nice and rather appropriate touch has Autobot X designed with bolts near the neck, much like nearly every visual representation of the monster. The monster itself was vilified for its looks and it is the unfamiliarity and hideousness of Spike's new body that causes him to have violent outbursts. In fact, at one point during the episode, Spike, in the body of Autobot X, is watching Frankenstein on Teletran 1. This causes him to realise what a monster he has become and leads him into the clutches of Megatron. Towards the end of the novel, the monster blames itself for the fate of its maker, similar to how Spike has a moment of clarity after endangering his father's life, when in both cases, the creators are ultimately the ones to blame for everything. Thankfully for Sparkplug, his son bears no ill will towards him. Luckily, the whole experience didn't scar Spike too much, as by the end of the Transformers series, he has become binary bonded to Cerebros. Or maybe he's just a glutton for punishment? Zombie. After the events of the movie, it was somewhat obvious that Optimus Prime would be brought back, especially if you saw it in UK theatres and the narration at the end told you he would return. The battle is over, but the galaxy-spanning adventures of the Transformers will continue, and the greatest Autobot of them all, Optimus Prime, will return. Bringing him back as a zombie, though, was slightly less obvious, and it was kind of genius. The Season 3 episode, entitled Dark Awakening, starts with the Autobots under attack from the Decepticons, the heroes taking refuge in a tomb they built for those that fell in the Great War, which was the huge battle we saw at Autobot City in Transformers the Movie. Daniel wanders off to explore the tomb, which seems like an odd thing to do, and runs into a zombified Optimus Prime in a genuinely terrifying moment. I can still remember watching that scene for the first time. Not believing Daniel, Rodimus Prime opens up Optimus's grave to see if there is a body inside, and surprisingly, though not to us, the casket is empty. Then, of course, the Decepticons show up and are promptly beaten down by Optimus, who then after a short while proceeds to blast the Autobots and run off. Zombie Optimus returns to the Autobot base on Cybertron and informs everyone that the Quintessons killed Rodimus and his friends, and takes them out en masse to destroy the Quintesson threat forever. Except it's all a Quintesson trick to annihilate the Autobots and take back Cybertron. Luckily, the Matrix restores Optimus's mind and he ends up sacrificing himself again to save the Autobots. The cartoon never really gave consistent examples of what would kill a Transformer, and seeing the ease with which the Quintessons rebuild Optimus in this episode does pose questions about how dead the others in the tomb really were. Admittedly, there were problems with Optimus's mind, and the Quintessons only wanted a basic machine to control, but the Matrix brought him back and would presumably work on others. However, all hope is lost when the tomb falls into a sun, thus destroying any chance of bringing them back. Hopefully, the Autobots learned from this, though, and kept any further bodies to themselves so that no one could use them against them. 
The design of Optimus Prime throughout this episode depicts him in various states of disrepair, with cracked windows and a broken radiator grill, which is a great touch. It's especially harrowing when we first see him in the episode when Daniel finds him in the tomb, as the flaws on his body are made all the more apparent with some atmospheric shadows. By the end of the episode, Optimus is missing an arm and half his face, very much a living dead version of himself. And it's here that I have to highlight the unique animation of Acom. For those that don't know, Korean studio Acom are often mocked for their rather subpar animation throughout the third season of Transformers. Acom had a history of using incorrect character models, incorrect colours, their staging was never the best, and the animation was rather choppy at times. However, as odd as this may sound, Acom's visual awkwardness beautifully complements the horror abound within this script. The odd movements combined with the subpar animation really do serve to boost the horror. Whilst I've no doubt that a studio such as Toei Doga, who performed great work on Transformers, would have effortlessly made a terrific looking episode, I feel that the visual sheen of a Toei episode would not have had we the audience feel as uneasy as we do with the visuals of Acom's animation. This may be one of the few times on this channel that you actually hear me praise Acom. Going back to Dark Awakening, the final explosion basically tells us that Optimus Prime is gone for good. Thus it's almost a shame that he did reappear in the season finale, The Return of Optimus Prime, as it wasn't nearly as good as this drama filled episode. Zombie Transformers also made an appearance in the UK Transformers comic. Issues 164 to 169 contain the stories entitled City of Fear, Legion of the Lost and Meltdown. Much more like your traditional zombie, there are legions of the undead attacking Ultra Magnus and the Sparkabots. Yes, the Sparkabots. In the city of Callus on Cybertron. The story actually features some similarities with Dark Awakening, namely in the return of Impactor as an undead zombie who ends up sacrificing his life for a second time to save Cybertron. A zombie Starscream appears in the story Race with the Devil in issues 215 to 218, where his reanimated corpse wanders around Peru after he was killed by the overwhelming power of the Underbase. Three characters that look surprisingly like Egon Spengler, Peter Venkman and Ray Stantz are also present in this story, as an easter egg by artist Andrew Wildman who was at the time working on the UK real Ghostbusters comic. And speaking of Ghostbusters, or ghosts at the very least, ghosts. Ghosts are generally apparitions of the deceased, which appear to the living in bodily likeness, usually with some form of unfinished business on this plane of existence. Of those who died in the movie, Starscream was the only one who wouldn't let death stop him because of course he wouldn't, it's Starscream. His ambition was what killed him and that self same ambition wouldn't let him die. Two episodes in season 3 were devoted to the return of Starscream, Starscream's ghost and Ghost in the Machine. In Starscream's ghost, his apparition is discovered by Octane in a Decepticon crypt and he goes on to possess Cyclonus and trick Galvatron into an Autobot ambush. Galvatron avoids being captured in the ambush and returns to Char where he learns of the ghost of Starscream who escapes by possessing Scourge. In Ghost in the Machine, Starscream makes a deal with the severed head of Unicron, now acting like a satellite around Cybertron. Starscream wants his body back and Unicron wants a new body by connecting his head to Cybertron. Using his ghostly powers of possession, Starscream ends up getting new eyes for Unicron from Metroplex and Trypticon, but cannot connect him to Cybertron without his own body. Unicron gives Starscream a new body and Starscream immediately betrays Unicron by running off as soon as he gets what he wants. Of course, it doesn't last long as by the end of the episode we're led to believe that the Decepticons kill him again. Starscream's ghost is exactly what you'd expect. He looks like Starscream, but is partially transparent and has no tangible form. However, he has the ability to possess seemingly anyone, including Trypticon at one point, and uses their bodies to their full extent, making you wonder why he wanted his body back in the first place. Surely Starscream's ability to jump into different bodies meant he could be ruling the Decepticons quite easily just by possessing Galvatron, and with less risk involved as he couldn't be killed and would be able to simply jump to another body if the need arose. Although with Starscream it was likely an ego related thing. He would want full credit for leading and couldn't do so if he was using someone else's body. The other question is why does Starscream come back as a ghost and no one else ever does? 
This wasn't actually addressed until the Beast Wars series, which retconned Sparks into continuity. A spark is basically the soul of a Transformer, but given physical form and held somewhere in their body. The Beast Wars episode Possession established that Starscream had a mutant spark, which was immortal and allowed him to possess others. And in the episode, Starscream's ghost possesses Waspinator. So in the end, Starscream wasn't actually a ghost, just a bizarre mistake. Vampire. Stripping the folklore down to its basics, vampires are energy leeches who survive on the life force of others. That simple idea works quite well with Transformers, where many stories revolve around the quest for Energon. So why not steal it from each other? Which brings us to the third season episode, The Dweller in the Depths, and the aforementioned idea not being used at all. The setup of this episode is yet another Quintesson plot to take back Cybertron. They really were a presence in season 3, weren't they? Before the Quintessons created the purely mechanical Transformers, they tried a biochemical mix called Transorganics. These failed miserably, and the ones that couldn't be destroyed were sealed away deep on Cybertron. One of these Transorganics is a creature known as the Dweller, an energy leech, much like a vampire. Thus the Quintessons tricked Galvatron into freeing these creatures in the hopes that the Dweller would run amok on Cybertron, draining all Transformers of their life force and leaving the planet free for them to regain. The designs of the Transorganics ranged from the silly to the frankly absurd. We see a gorilla with tentacles for arms, an armadillo ankylosaurus type creature, a walking man trap with lizard like legs, an overgrown burble, a mechanical snake, a mechanical bird and the dweller itself, a giant sandworm with Dr Octopus style mechanical appendages. However the actual concept is interesting in its implications if not its applications. Going by the cartoon continuity, the Quintessons created the Transformers and so the Transorganics can be seen as their ancestors in some ways. By the end of the US cartoon series, the purely mechanical Transformers began to integrate organics into themselves with the Headmasters and Targetmasters. Biomechanical Transformers seemed to be the norm when Beast Wars rolled around, and then Beast Machines went even further with techno-organic beings, a balanced melding of technology and biology. While they may have initially appeared to be a throwaway idea, the Transorganics were both the past and a possible future of the Transformers. The energy vampire concept in Transformers would have been more fun if it was based around Bram Stoker's interpretation, if actual Transformers had been running around sucking the life force from their comrades for most of the episode. Then again, when the Transformers are leached of their energy in this episode, they are more like traditional zombie style Transformers that we saw earlier in this particular video, specifically with the episode Dark Awakening. So it wasn't all bad. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, share and subscribe.